Okay, we're live. So, welcome uh, everyone to the Gen X Experience Leadership Roundtable Series. This is episode three, which looks at innovation and entrepreneurship as critical for the African continental free trade area, which I shall further to refer to as the AFCFTA. My name is Shirley Inzer, and I'm a UK-based Ghanaian-born ex-Big Five consultant, entrepreneur, and private investor. I'll be your host and moderator for the next 90 minutes. This event is being sponsored by Acasia Online and is being carried across multiple platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. So just some housekeeping before we proceed. If you've not already done so, please subscribe to the channel and like and share the screen to help engage other people who could benefit from the discussion. So at the Genesis Experience, we focus on creating economic opportunity and building an enabling environment to bring about sustainable social economic change. Join our mailing list to be the first to get updated on future roundtables, events, and other, um, other announcements. So let's make the most of this session by making it an interactive. I'll be moderating and sharing any questions and comments that I see posted in the comments area. So use this opportunity to get any direct questions that you'd want from our panel of experts. Allow me to introduce the topic for this evening. So the Africa Free Trade Agreement was brokered by the African Union on, and first signed by 44 of the 55 nations in Kigali, Rwanda on March 21st of 20, 2018. We're now a few years down the line, and so by now, many would have already heard about the free trade agreement. The agreement commits countries to remove 90% of tariffs on goods and liberalize <laughs> trade between the 55 nations of Africa. And it is a significant step to realizing a unified free trade bloc, creating a market of 1.3 billion people and more than 2 trillion USD in GDP. The economists estimate the free trade area could lead to an increase of 25% in intracontinental trade and billions of economic gains. So most of us are aware, are aware of the potential. We're also aware that much lies ahead in terms of you know, the innovation and the entrepreneurship as key success factors. Sorry. I'd like to explore the challenges and opportunities surrounding these critical success factors. The conversation we're about to have right now is one that I feel that anybody involved in policy, governance, compliance, legal risk, reporting, technology, business, finance, taxation, investment, <laughs> capacity building and employment should be part of. In actual fact, I'd like to say that as Africans, both at home and in the diaspora, we all have a stake in this monumental program to deliver sustainable outcomes for the continent and to create sustainable economic opportunity for future generations. It's all eyes on Africa. So today I'm joined by an amazing panel of experts who will help me unpack the role of innovation and entrepreneurship as critical success factors for the free trade area. But we're also gonna be looking at the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my esteemed guests for this evening. So this evening, <laughs> We have uh, Louis, so one second. <coughs> Louis, I hope I don't destroy your name. So Louis Yao Afol is the Executive Director of the AFCFTA Policy Network Group. He's also a trade practitioner with expertise in trade policies, private sector development, and future innovation. Besides this involvement in the policy network, he also runs the Women of Africa Network. We also have Emmanuel A. Gamor. Um, Emmanuel, <laughs> you're welcome. Emmanuel is a business professional, entrepreneur, and owner of the podcast called Unpacking Africa. He has over a decade of experience in youth engagement, digital and managerial innovation, entrepreneurship and leadership education. He's a faculty member of the University of Stellenbosch's education, Executive Education on Digital Reputational Management and co-chair of the World Economic Forum Global Shapers Advisory Council on Knowledge and Impact. Welcome, Emmanuel. We have also today. <laughs> Sorry, one second. There you go. Okay, so, so we also have um, Foster. Foster, I went to see Foster is founder and president of 
the Hack Lab Foundation, which is an international non-profit organization headquartered in Ghana, with reach in Libya, Syria, uh, sorry, Sierra Leone, and India. It is focused on preparing the youth for future digital jobs through technology, education, and skills development. Um, the Hack Lab also runs um, boot camps, hackathons, September. <laughs> Mentoring and coaching, internship, digital skills training, and your placement. Welcome, Foster. We have Thank as you very well much for Darlington Okobo. <laughs> You're welcome. Hi, I could just see. You. Hi. So we also have Darlington Okobo, who is involved in AI and technology across several multiple platforms and industries. And founder and director of Interview um, Artificial Intelligence. And its subsidiary, such as Nuno Health. He's the lead of the topic group, uh, topic group on AI for radiology with the UN International Telecom Union and the HWHA's focus group on international, in, sorry, artificial intelligence, but a lot to remember, um, and leads the development of global regulations and standards for AI in radiology. Gentlemen, I have to say that this is a very short summary of your profiles, I'm aware. You're all leaders in your field, and I've invited you here as people at the forefront of key developments in relation to the realization of the Africa continental free trade area. So, um, at this point, I think I'd just like to dive in a little bit, um, and just kick things off for those who aren't too familiar with the free trade agreement and the free trade area. I think I'm gonna kick off with Louis. If you could just explain a little bit about the history and also, the difference between the area and the equipment. Thank you very much. Um, greetings to all my fellow partners or panelists. I think I could recognize uh, Emmanuel. It's been a long while. Emmanuel um, Nice meeting you here too. Yes. Uh, the Pan African dream was to have um, a single market way back. And so the Pan-African dream was to have a series of um, integrated programs by the African Union. And so uh, I think it was built up in 2018. I mean, let me take out all the processes out. But in 2018, the heads of state in one summit in Kigali decided that, look, if we say we keep waiting, we'll be waiting for long, let's just sign it. What were they going to sign? They were going to sign an agreement that will bring 54 or 55 countries to have one single market, what we call the continental free trade area. The continental free trade agreement is the agreement that, that made way for the area. So it was an agreement which was negotiated on so many protocols, which became the area or which formed the area or the free trade area. And so without the agreement, we couldn't have had an area where countries outside Africa became third parties. And so the focus of the agreement was to have tariff liberalization of up to 90%. And this tariff liberalization of 90% was going to be progressive. So uh, Africa was divided into three big economies, the large, the, the developed economies, the growing economies, and the least or what they call the group of six. And so the group of the first group, the developed economies of Africa, including Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, and co, uh, were to uh, liberate or liberalize their tariffs for, uh, within the first five years. The second group will be progressive, and the third group will take some time before they liberalize entirely 90%. And therefore, there were a lot of protocols that formed the agreement, which we call the phase one and the phase two. The phase one has to be with what we have, trading goods, trading services, and free movement of people. The free movement of people was tied in the Abuja Treaty, which, which makes um, countries who allow members to move freely. And therefore, the phase two has not yet been negotiated, which is also very key. Phase two has to do with investment, competition, and then intellectual property rights. When all these six or seven are put together, they have a complete negotiated agreement, but for now, it has to be, uh, we have to start with trading goods, trading services, and, 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 and its protocols. There are various protocols under all the ones I've mentioned. And so this was what the, uh, the, the House of States envisaged. 
Therefore, what happened? They have to, um, uh, we're waiting for the 22nd country to have submitted his let, uh, her letter of uh, uh, what we call uh, instrument of ratification. Then it became into force. So April, we had about 22 countries, I think April, May. However, trading has not yet started. And the difference between the agreement coming into force and trading is that the agreement came into force because per the, the, the negotiations, 22 countries who are members can start off. And so certain protocols could be observed. However, trading was to commence in July. Trading was to commence, which means that when they say trading, it means that that was when tariff liberalization was going to start entirely. And so July, it was postponed because of COVID and other issues and has been postponed, God willing, to January 2021. As it stands now, not all African countries who have signed are members. It means that if trading was to start today, some countries will not benefit from the tariff liberalization, including Nigeria, including most countries in the AMU, Af uh, Arab Maghreb. Some of them have signed, but they've not ratified. It, these three stages are very, very key. And so you cannot accord the concessions to any country that has not become a member, even though they have signed. And this is how far we've come. And out of that, uh, the agreement say, let us have a secretariat. So the Secretariat became the Pan-African headquarters of the African Continental Free Trade Area, like you have the European Union. And it forms part of the Agenda 23 of the African Union vision of 100-year celebration. To have one market, after one market, they're going to have a common custom or custom union. From the custom, they're going to have one single currency. From the currency, they're going to have one passport. It goes systematically. So now we are at the market level. We've had one single market. We'll move on to the next series custom, but a lot of hurdles have to be removed. We have to test God within 2021 whether the tariff liberalization, how is it going to be like? Finally, I would like to say that countries that are, do not have the same economic capacity to to, to you know to give away fully like that, from Exim Bank is making credit facility for them within uh, two years so that they can it can keep them to uh, sustain this. Secretariat has been headquartered in Africa, in Ghana, because seven countries bid it. And when the seven countries bid it, Ghana won. There were a lot of factors that contributed to our winning. It wasn't just because of anything, but a team of experts were sent to do monitoring and evaluation. This is how far we have come. Okay, Shall that's quite an introduction. Thank you, Lee. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so thank you, Louis. So I just think that in terms of the innov innovation and entrepreneurship, I mean, what would you say, if we can kick off the topics about, you know, we know that the opportunities that um, automation and industrialization provide, but if we now kind of like start talking about what would you say are the key kind of goals and the key barriers to that, that piece? Um, and, and, you know, what that means for an entrepreneurs, such as Darlington. I mean, I think Darlington, actually, I, I think maybe I'll let you stop with this one because, yeah, you kind of work quite globally and, yeah, the impact is the... Uh, you're on mute, by the way. I'll mute you. He's muted. Oh, I can't. You're on mute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. So yeah, um, you know, having an agreement that says that you want to trade within uh, Africa is great. Reducing tariff is great, but that doesn't necessarily imply that there's going to be some smooth trading process. So there are a lot of issues. Infrastructure is one of them. Uh, logistics. So even with in African countries, it's difficult to move goods. Uh, and this has been a challenge for e-commerce, but just generally also businesses as well. So if you want if you want to expand it across different African countries, this is going to be one of the issues. How do we truly move goods as well as people efficiently between different African countries? So um, there's a lot of ways technology could help with this. We have currently, um, I think one of the impressive things we have is a Kobo 360. So this is a startup from Nigeria. They already operate in a few African countries where they manage logistics. So one of the things they work with is trackers. Um, if you want to move your goods from, say, Lagos to Abuja, 
Uh, it can be a hassle, but they make it. They're basically the Uber of trackers. Um, and so they are trying to make that process efficient where people who are track drivers can use the platform to get a lot of gigs. But also if you want to move your goods, you can have access to people. You can see where they are, how closer they are to you, uh, the platform guys. And so these are... This is just one of the ways that technology could help in actually making the process of the free trade agreement actually implementable and practical. But I'm sure we'll get into majority of it as a conversation proceeds. Yeah. So I just want to pick up on that, darling. Thing. So you as an entrepreneur, do you have? I mean, we have things like good people services. We talked a bit about goods. I think that's the most challenging. Um, because there's so many sort of elements. But what about things like services and you know the treatment of things like data privacy and all that kind of stuff? Um, mm. Is there a way? Is there a place that you? Um, I think okay. So yeah, do you want to pick up on that? Because I wanted to get Emmanuel on that. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, Emmanuel can go. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Thanks again. It's a pleasure to be here. And yes, to have Louis, Dale, and Costa. We've all worked together in various capacities um, to make sure that, uh, in, I think, the uh, dissemination of information. And two, um, part of what we do about creating a future agreement. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm just going to check if the sound is good for everyone else. Could you sound a bit low for me. Is it good for everyone yeah. else? The manual sound? Okay. Yeah, can you There's a, a little brick. Yeah, it's a bit weak. Okay. It's a little bit weak. It's kind of um is it... try again. Try again. Ah, oh, it's a bit. <laughs> okay. I'm trying to speak it sounds like it's I'm yeah. I well, let's so let's, let's, let's give it a try. Let's give it a try. Okay, cool. So what I was saying was um, a couple of things, and, and it's really in the back of a good foundation that's just there, right? Um, understanding one where the uh, economic community was built up from the, um, and then creating the after. But one of the things that is really important and the ways that entrepreneurs can engage immediately is understanding that the continental future agreement, yes, is power or I guess it's lessons learned from regional already existing FTAs. So uh, future agreements like ECOWAS, Comisa, East Africa, as well as SEDAC. Um, there was recently a report on regional integration in that. And so entrepreneurs keeping eyes on these of things helps you understand what the entire um, the future agreement looks like for a region, if you are able to look at your particular uh, regional agreement, so both in West Africa, look at what are some of the challenges and metrics that have been going on, what are the costs. So, for ECOWAS example, um, having high scores and, and things like being able to um, free movement of people, having the ECOWAS passport allows for professional space of travel, but there are infrastructure challenges that need to be looked at, right? Having infrastructure in South Africa moving around and having a complicated finance structure becomes an example in which it's adopted for some of the protocols that this was speaking on. East Africa also traditionally has a logistic framework and tries to create all these stuff in the market. If you're an entrepreneur now and you're asking which ways can innovation or continental trade agreement apply to you and effectively help you achieve what you're, you're, you're supposed to do, you have to look at it in, in one within your bilateral agreements that are happening in the region itself. How do you plug in and the effect that you have, right? So a good thing that Lewis mentioned was part of, or actually that was also you, Shirley, a lot of what we're calculating now that is going to be helpful with the context of future agreements are welfare effects. It is costly for you to do, to, to trade to be an entrepreneur at this point because of barriers of entry. And, and the immediate kind of savings of cost in you operating in these markets is the fact that tariffs are harmonized in a way that you have savings for that. Entrepreneurs that already should start to look at your, your, your supply demand chain and say, okay, these things are going to come in where you now have a single market without these barriers. How does that affect other processes and innovation, customer delivery, uh, particularly an expansion of market, right? 
if we're talking about tech folks, and I know that balancing is big on artificial intelligence and AI and data, a lot of times, a lot of the ecosystems that we have in the tech spaces struggle to scale. So you have a tech system that is based in uh, Ghana, Togo, and in and, and, um, other countries, Benin and others, they don't have the population size of Nigeria. They not benefit from Ethiopia. Having the continental free trade agreement all of a sudden opens a marketplace where you know that your registration, your ways of doing business affects and allows you to scale in ways that now make sense for a lot of um, the products and services. If you look at it, you're competing not just with products and services. Yeah. I'm so, Emmanuel, I'm so, I'm so sorry because the guys are saying they can't really hear you. Um, I thought it was just my internet, but they're saying it's breaking. Um, even so, I don't know if um, you can position yourself and try and come back. Okay, cool. I will try again. I don't. I'll try and set it up again and come back on it. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, no, I I got a lot of it, but it was um yeah, it's really hard to hear. So. Um, yeah, just see if you can reconnect. All right, cool. Um, yeah, you wanted to jump in. Thank you, Emmanuel. Yeah, you wanted to jump in uh, while um, before Emmanuel started. Do you want to pick up from where he picked up? <laughs> I couldn't hear you much because uh, the line was not really clear. Um, but if if you had him and you could give me this a bit summary, I will I will take talking, it from there. He talks a bit, a bit about well, I struggled a little bit, but I did pick up what you said about Ecowas and Kameta. So it was uh, looking at some of the messages that were in that, um, and then kind of trying to learn how we can learn from what has been done in the past. That's more or less kind of what I got. So um, does that make some sense or? Because I, I was the original question. Sorry, a lot of it was not me. So, um, I mean, I, I suppose the question we could talk about was uh, the EF, the free trade areas, not the best of its kind. Other initiatives such as uh, FOS, I probably say that wrong all the time. Um, so, what is different about this time? Well, the biggest difference is that apart from the WTO. The continental free trade is the largest free trade area with the size of expectation of a, a, a trade uh, a revenue of about uh, $2.3 trillion and a population of $1.2 billion. The, the, concept, the focus is about market. The focus is about exports. The focus is about how the, we can boost intra-African trade. The focus is how you can reduce your export ratio, cost of export ratio. What do I mean by that? It is, for example, before then, there were existed agreements with the blue regional blocks already. Okay, I mean, ECOWAS had something to do, East Africa had something to do, and so forth. So, however, 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 this is a single agreement that has been signed by all the 54 presidents and said that we have committed to concede or to give concessions of 90% of tariff liberalization. That is not a joke. Because that most of them depend upon uh, well, uh, revenue from import and export in true tariffs and what have you. And so to give away and to allow for competition and to allow for investment and to allow for uh, trade, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what do you call it? Um, 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 IPRS, I mean, um, uh, 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 IPRS. It is not easy. And so the focus actually has to do with opening markets among. African. For example, if somebody is in Ghana, previously he couldn't have exported certain things beyond Africa. Okay? Especially then he was going to have few quotas. For example, if I'm here, I can identify that in Nigeria, maybe I can decide to take interest in school uniforms. I'm targeting a population of about 200. That is any category that gives me that access. And this is 90%. However, there is 10% restriction. And the 10% restriction, the difference is that the 10% restriction is to protect infant industries, mm -hmm. is to protect startups, so that the 10% has to do with sensitive and exclusive list. The sensitive and exclusive list means that these areas, you cannot enter my territory with it freely, no. And so there is a certain, uh, uh, apart from the rules of origin, there's a certain percentage that has been reserved to protect members in certain areas. And so members were asked to submit their list of products or their list of areas that 
uh, other members cannot really trade freely. And that is one of the things that was the, the summit that was held in February. But unfortunately, not all countries have been able to submit their schedules. It is very, very, very important so that if uh, most stakeholders, trade unions in most every country have been given the privy to know the list from which their, uh, their country negotiated. For example, if I take Ghana, I have privy to see the list. Most of them are agricultural products and what have you. And I know that such products, Ghana is not going to let it be free trade. It's going to make sure that the tariff charge on those 10%. This is one unique thing about the agreement compared to other areas. And so it means that apart from that, the agreement does not bind you entirely. I mean, after five years, if you are not interested in staying in the free trade, you can quit. This is what the agreement says. After five years, if a member of country realizes that it's not going on for him or what have you, you can quit. The procedure is there. And so, um, 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 no, nevertheless, even though I didn't hear what uh, Gamma said, it is something that is a bold step. Uh, it's not so unique, but the uniqueness is that all the 54 countries or 55 presidents have agreed that this time around we are taking off. Secondly, you've been quick with their secretariat. Thirdly, um, they have been quick with certain uh, digital uh, instruments like the uh, Pan-African payment system. And I was saying that I, I happened to be part of this process earlier on before it was uh, it became what we see now. I, I propose that for how long will Africa depend on, my, uh, on Visa and the MasterCard? Can't we have our own unique way of electronic payment? And so if you use the uh, Afrimazing Bank's product of an African payment system is to facilitate trade facilitation and easy border payment, even from the informal sector to the formal sector. Swear by in those days, you can be in Nigeria or Ghana, you, have, you find it difficult to transfer money or to uh, trade in uh, any other the currency of the other uh, member state. But with the Pan African payment system, which is also yet to pile up more, that has been solved. It all currencies have been kind of uh, put in a one, one you know, in the layman's term, one umbrella where you can be in your comfort of your country and transact with a member state, uh, 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 client in the member state through that Pan African payment system. In, 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 within 24 hours, in fact, it, 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 it should go through. But compared to the past, the same is going to happen under the agreement in terms of aviation, where sometimes you are, if you are going through Egypt, you have to go and pass through even Dubai before you can go through Egypt. These, so all this is a systematic kind of integration. And I don't know if um, and that's what Mano was, but I couldn't hear much. But for me, I think this is some of the areas that uh, the agreement is binded by so many protocols. And time on open minutes go into every protocol. And all the protocols fall under the categories that I've mentioned. In all the country, the only thing that is left now is that the rules of origin uh, is about 98% ready. The rules of origin is about 500 pages. This is what is going to tie them. It's the rules of origin that is going to tie them. What, what, uh, and it's based upon preferential treatment. And not most favored nation is based upon preferential treatment by among member states. Therefore, if a third country, if a member state wants to trade with another country outside the free trade, whatever that you are going to trade, make sure that it's not you are not going to give your members prefer, uh, uh, most favored nation and give the third country, the third party country, uh, preferential treatment. No, let it be transparent. So it means that if Kenya is having, uh, like what we are hearing, Kenya's agreement with the United States, the new trade issue, whatever that Kenya is going to have with the United States, after does not go against it. However, after it's a concern that it should not be done in opaque, it should be transparent. And whatever concessions Kenya is going to give the United States, that same concession must be given to all the member states. This is the path that they have ascended to, to, to participate. Emmanuel. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Emmanuel, I'm going to give you a quick comment because I just want to check that uh, I wanted to uh, grab some comment from uh, Foster as well. But Foster as well. I'm so sorry okay, about good. your uh, connection. Yeah. Is it better now? If I it is, you just go better thumbs now. Up. Oh, excellent, cool. So I yeah, just wanted really to hone good. it in on 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 um, for the entrepreneur specifically because Lewis has a, a, um, has been part of the process right from just regional FTAs, even from ECOWAS and and. Than the projection into after so he's done he's laid down a lot of the, the groundwork on country negotiations but as an entrepreneur you need to understand a bit of what he's talking about one from phase one to phase two and two the impact of integrated markets because when integrated markets come in now all of a sudden it's it starts to move big ticket investments and and money items right so what we talk about when we say the harmonizing of borders you're no longer looking at um, rules and regulations that bound um, an entrepreneur from Togo, for example, from engaging in Lesotho. And I'm using geographically smaller 
kind of co- countries because within trade there's there's a gravity model that the proximity and size of your market dictates certain advantages or disadvantages right so all of a sudden you can look at and a lot of times entrepreneurs talk about a homogenous uh, market space or scalability those are the early wins that you can look at right that being said on on the large systems model for example you look at electricity and you look at power so you look at energy sector some countries have very protectionist policy around energy so for those of you for example here i'm in south africa now um, for your audience i'm going through some type of load shedding right but it's because of the, the way that agreements are set up if you have a harmonized space you can have all kinds of um, power supply now being given into areas where there might be a discrepancy in distribution um, consumption and supply So what I was trying to say before I jumped to this point was that a lot of the um, free trade agreement takes its um, grounding from already existing FTAs. So free trade agreements as in uh, COMISA, SADAC, EAC, East Africa Community, and ECOWAS. So if you're listening and you're paying attention now and you're wondering, how do you plug into these things? The infrastructure that Lois says is high level and has to do with quite a number of representatives. So the ministry and trade uh, finance ministries on monitoring and evaluation. On the lower level, you need to be an advocate as an entrepreneur group. If you're part of an association, you need to be finding out exactly what the positives and and there's a a, a regional integration index report that came out two months ago. Look at uh, the region that you're coming from, where you work at. Look at the gaps and holes in that and start to fill that. Because as an entrepreneur, those are opportunities that you can fill in interlopability when he speaks about the pan-african trade for currency it's one of the largest reasons why it's incredibly difficult in order to purchase whether goods and services you have to buy on a capital market on a currency that is the euro or dollar but all of a sudden when you have a when you have a a free market those type of uh uh, fees that you're paying uh, the delays in, in getting cash flows and others are eradicated now you can actually do butter and trade agreements because it's a single market it allows innovation and financing right um i'll, I'll um, close with this so that my, my brother can get a word in for me on on my end um particularly on innovation right you start to look at the, the diffusion of knowledge and then the manufacturing so if we look at our kind of like even from an industrial standpoint our manufacturing base is german equipment um, some of our telcos are either from china and other places and you ask yourself what does it take to have uh, uh, an African business that can scale and compete on the world scale. It actually takes a large enough local market that has these players coming in. And that market then grows and gets better with time because the customer base um, helps it be able to become a global competitor. Um, and I'm sure Darlington can also share on that with some of the things that he's working on innovation. I don't know if Foster has dropped off, but I'll defer to you, Shelley, on how you want to move forward. Because I know that with Lewis and I, we have we have different, quite a bit of, of things to share and different aspects on the continental free trade agreement as well. I, I need to get Foster, uh, oh, he's getting <laughs> Foster. I'd love you to jump in and I'd like to find out how all this affects you and the work that you're doing. Okay, so um, amongst the many technicalities uh, regarding the CFTA, the biggest, uh, the two key uh, elements which uh, I think entrepreneurs would need address this access and information. And it's unfortunate that a lot of these guys cannot afford the consultants and technical experts to break down the CFTA and its provisions to uh, expose them to what opportunities and benefits are available for them to explore, right? And and this this is one of the things that needs to be addressed in terms of access to information. Um, And so we can have all the conversation and we move forward to talk about um, how the, it benefits the entire economy and all of that. But if we are unable to get these things translated to the young guy, the SME, who is going to, who is contributing almost 90% to Africa's GDP and going to significantly become the, the giants of Africa, then we are not really solving the problem around how the potential the CFT has, right? And so my my biggest my biggest ask to people like uh, Yao is how do we create a consolidated platform where conversations are had between agencies that will pop up in the course of implementing CFTA uh, to get these information across to these young guys? Because even if you zoom down to just Ghana, right? 
Um, GIPC, for example, has investment policies. And a lot of startups end up not being able to secure investments because they do not understand the uh, investment policy or architecture within the country. And so they move and then they hit a roadblock and then they now have to set up a company in Delaware which has its own implications on their business and trade through their parent company which they set up in Delaware through to Ghana. At the end of the day, you are still moving money back into your parent company to pay taxes or whatever it is you need to do over there. And Ghana is losing. So it's, it gets more and more technical when you bring it down to the common African, the woman who crosses the border every day to Togo to buy things and crosses back to Ghana to trade. How does CFTA, what does it mean to her? And how does she take advantage of it when trading begins, for example, and then she, she, she doesn't have information around tax exemptions or tax reliefs and all of that. You get it. So we need to find a way. How do we break that communication barrier and how do we create that room or pipeline for them to be able to uh, uh, assimilate or comprehend whatever it is the provisions are of the CFTA. Yeah, yeah. that's, Shelley, that's really a really add, good uh, consideration. Shelly, I wanted to jump in quickly. I might have go to ahead. go off a bit, but um so one of the things just to be honest and put a card out there there's always been a hesitance around the um the african union i think for a lot of people that there, there's always been this gap in understanding what is the role of the african union in our daily lives and there's been a lot of critique um, about the how effective the african union has been because some of it is warranted because a lot of what the work is that is done is not translated in your everyday news broadcast some of some of the folks and for us as my brother in different mm -hmm. avenues the news outlets that we have access to are typically either western um, um western media sites or think tanks and others of other places that have a budget specifically for marketing and distribution what i would also say on um breaking down the after the after kind of implementation for lower level folks is we're at the stage where a lot of the things that would help SMEs and people and communities happens in the implementation. Once it, it, you, you get to see that the Continental Free Trade Agreement is working for you uh, in terms of the harmonization we're talking about, it makes a lot more sense than this kind of preemptive stage. So because of the pandemic, the implementation has been pushed to January. If you still have the conditions where people are um, have tariffs and barriers and, and other things where we, we're still um, having created fair baseline reports for monitoring and evaluation, which the Secretariat in Ghana is tasked to do, right? It's very difficult for you to share good news when it's not good for everybody. So th there mm -hmm. is that element. Another part about it is also understanding that the, comp the, the free trade is similar to if you look at the Euro bloc or you, you look at NAFTA. So not every American knows that there's enough um, American free trade agreement between Canada and Mexico and the United States, but they do benefit from it. The reason why we're championing it is because we've had such large infrastructural change um, challenges when we talk about moving big money, right? Well, now you have an African Continental Free Trade Agreement. You can have an investor bring in 500 million for a single ticket issue, and the person knows that it would spread across country lines and it would break some of the diversity and historical challenges we've had because most of our trade um, lies with previous historical colonial arrangements. So for Foster, I think definitely yes there has to be a lot more work that's done there are numerous associations now um the the new secretary general um Wam Kalamene is is young and passionate and driven the au has a youth wing and they're trying to put quite a number of um uh, instagram um infographics on social media lois is the executive director and group head of a diaspora and ghana after um group there are so many in different regional groups. If you're interested in the technical and trade as it goes along, yes, you hear about it. But the actual implementation, I think countries will start to trumpet it a bit more once it, it becomes implemented in the country. That bridges that gap. What I, I'm advocating for is beyond just knowing that after it exists. Uh, what I'm advocating for is that because we know something that opens those barriers now, we need our entrepreneurs to think as if Africa is a single market. Because it's that demand side that's going to get um, both uh, politicians, finance instructors, people who are willing to invest to know that we're pushing for the after to, to work for us. And that's what I wanted to jump in really quickly. Thanks, Shirley. <laughs> Thank you for that. Louis, uh, I think Foster made a very direct uh, um, question to you. So you want to pick that up? And please pick it up in terms of not just the everyday person, but even people in the diaspora, such as myself. 
potential investors? Um, thank you, Darlington. Let me quickly say that. Uh, Foster, the, there have been so many processes to break it down for the ordinary person to understand number one. Number two, um, we have all the ministries of trade who are the supervising agency of the African Connected Free Trade Agreement within their respective countries are supposed to engage in technical working groups that will promote the what we call the BIAT, the boosting in trafficking trade. Under it, we have trade information, trade finance, trade policy, and what have you. Under trade information, every country is supposed to build a, an information repository. It's supposed to build a national information repository where associations, stakeholders can go and find information regarding the Connector Free Trade Agreement. Again, the African Connector Free Trade Agreement does not stipulate to any country how to strategize to benefit. It all boils down to how a country can strategize to benefit the, from the market and position itself to export more. And so if you look at the key indicators of the boost into African trade, I've mentioned trade information, trade facilitation, factors of production, or now we call it the factor industrialization. We have market segmentation. We have trade finance. All these, if you, if you take Ghana, Ghana have taken seven strategies to develop the continental free trade. That is the national approach. And so Ghana's seven approach, if one of them is trade information, Ghana said, how am I going to let people understand what it's all about? So under trade information, then uh, they are going to partner institutions like Ministry of Trade, partner in Ministry of Foreign Affairs, partner other associations to decimate, to sensitize, to ad advocate for people to understand. Secondly, if you come to trade facilitation, agencies and companies that work around border issues and what have you also been grouped to be able to participate and come up with a way forward. Then when you come to the factor productivity, uh, infrastructure is key. And so Ghana is positioning itself like if you take railway, a lot has been done moving all the way to, in fact, the initial plan was to end at Paga, but Ghana want to continue as far as Burkina for so why? Because under this, Ghana want to make sure that there's that joint adventureship between member states. So when Ghana ends in Burkina Faso, the railway, maybe Burkina Faso can also continue even as far as Dakar. And so, yes, the ministries of trade are mandated to make sure that they strategize how people will benefit and understand the economy in their respective countries. And I can speak for Ghana. Um, Gamma made a very important position. Some CSOs, for example, if we take my network, after policy network, and in the words of BBC, we've been the largest free trade network. We, we started sensitization in Ghana and all over. It has not been easy. And, 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 and we are still doing it. What we want to do is to offer professional service to most of these government and private sectors who might not know how to start and how to benefit from continental free trade. And like you said, Foster, one of the, uh, if it's going to be zero if we start talking technicalities and no one breaks it down. That's why the media is supposed to be part of this whole uh, process because we can do things in the dark. If the media does not create programs along the line to really um, uh, uh, go down to the market. In fact, we have a program coming up with one of the radio stations in Ghana very soon where we are going to go down to the marketplaces, the farms, and what have you to make people understand what do they benefit from the continental free trade agreement? What are the protocols? Let me give you a key benefit. If we take in trade in services, trade in services we have, it, it brings financial services, it brings tourism, it brings uh, hospitality, it brings insurance. All those professional services fall under trading services, communication, and what have you. Maybe if you take tourism, there can be that tourism exchange, for example, because we can identify the areas of tourism potentials in your country and see how you can exchange with another member state or sell it out. If you take education like this, education is a service, you can decide to export skills. For example, if I'm in Ghana, I know that when you take Mauritius, Mauritius is service industry is about 85% to the GDP. And therefore, if for example, I'm a graduate of banking and finance, and I realize that I can't get a job in Nigeria, I can't get a job in Ghana, I can decide to go under the protocol of free movement to Mauritius to find myself a job or establish myself there. These are hidden basic opportunities that needs to be brought out either by the supervising agency, Ministry of Trade and Industry, or by CSOs and by private sector for people to catch up and position themselves. 
And so as time goes on, I'll be bringing out some of the uh, opportunities bit by bit. But this is some of the first. For instance, if you take my network, we decided to stretch our our, our strategy by engaging the diaspora. So we form, as uh, Gamo said, we have formed we call the diaspora offices of after policy network. What is, what is their role? Their role is to make sure that we are organizing an international summit year by year, and we are going to replicate it throughout all the 55 countries by bringing investment from the, and our definition of diaspora, mind you, we have defined diaspora not to mean color. We have defined diaspora to mean any geographical position beyond Africa. So because it can be in Japan and we see you as a diaspora. How can we bring the diaspora resources as a, through the continental free trade, maybe through protocol of investment, to invest in sectoral benefits of most of these African economies. You just don't go to a country and start investing. You have to know what is available to invest in and the sectoral areas you have to invest in. That is what we all need to put up for people to really accept it. And, and if I should deviate a bit, that is one of the reasons Nigeria has not yet ratified. Why? Because the stakeholders, the trade unions, the association, they say they don't understand. So they don't see why their president should ratify it. They want to understand and know the benefit before they can allow their president, uh, their, their government to ratify. And I can understand them. These are some of the things that uh, I, I think that with time to be one of the responsibilities of the after secretary to make sure that information trickles down to the grassroots. Okay, uh, I actually wanted to ask a follow-up question on that. Um, so I was going to ask Oscar whether you had sufficiently addressed this concern, but uh, he seems to be having issue. So I'm just going to go to Darlington because obviously Darlington with his work in AI and the collection of data, what I'd like to find out is about is data protection, things like laws and data privacy. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, yeah, so one interesting thing is that most African countries do have data protection act um and we do occasionally hold even conferences across the various african countries so i think it was last year so last year there was one held right here in ghana uh, for the various african countries and as far as the actual policies and regulations that fall under data protection act it's quite similar across the various african countries um it's also not vastly different from the gdpr of uh, eu so you have certain basic things like uh, if you have personal identifiable information, then people need to have access to information, uh, access to, was it, erasure. So basically what you're talking about is that if you are building the solutions, say in Ghana, and you want to deploy this across multiple African countries, what you need to abide by is that if you're collecting people's personal information, they need to know what information you're collecting, what you intend to use it for. Um, and then they should have the opportunity to decide, you can collect this, you can't collect this. And if you've collected it for years, they should still have the opportunity to go on your platform and say, delete everything you have about me or show me everything you've collected in the last five years. So the, the advantage is that it's not vastly different from the various African countries. Quickly, I would like to make some quick points connected to some of the points that have been made earlier. So Gamma made mention of the power of the single market if you are an entrepreneur. And I think for those of us in the digital economy, this is perfect. So if you are looking at Silicon Valley right now, right, then you are, you started a tech company, you are a young Facebook somewhere about over a decade almost like 15 years ago, you were starting. If you start in the valley, in that simple small valley, you automatically have access to a, a market that is over $20 trillion with uh, over 200 million people. You have access to it. It's digital, they have very little infrastructure. People have access to internet. Boom, they have access to your platform. You have very little effort you need to put into them scale into that market. That is what we haven't had in Africa. Some people have said that basically in Africa, we've had what is called mushroom startups. You start and you try your best to scale within your country and then you get stuck right in there. There are very few that have actually started. They are truly startups and they've scaled beyond that. People will tell you Jumia and the rest, but if you start to look into Jumia, there are a lot of issues. You have to back out of certain African countries because they've been having issues. Um, 
So yes, this free trade agreement potentially, let's be, let's highlight that potentially could give us that opportunity where if you start a digital startup somewhere in Africa, you could have access to a large pool of, uh, you could have access to basically the African continent. And I am happy that um, the African Union has factored digital payment into this, but it also would be nice if you have some private sector uh, entities compete or provide competing solutions. So even the, the mobile money systems that are very much prevalent and ubiquitous across Africa now, we in Ghana, for example, we have interoperability across the various providers. So Vodafone, MTN, and Airtel Tigo, you can go from one platform and transfer money to the other. It would be nice for them to start looking at how to move money from Ghana to Nigeria with my MTN mobile money and transfer to MTN mobile money account in Nigeria or to Flu or something else in Nigeria. So this is one powerful thing we can do. But also very importantly will be the escrow services. So escrow services, uh, basically what happens is this. If I'm transacting business with another person, by the default, I just send you money and I expect you to give me whatever I pay for. However, if you are somewhere else in another African country, I don't know if I can trust you. I don't know if you're actually going to give what I'm paying for. I was almost duped a few weeks ago right here in Ghana, by the way. So um, with escrow, what you do is that you have this third party and then you put that money, you give that money to that third party and the other party can tell the money is now with the third party. If you give me what I'm looking for, the money will then move from the third party to you. And so you have this person that is playing the intermediary. Now, we can. this could be the mobile money providers as they exist now. But to even be more modern with tech, they are smart contracts, blockchain. You don't even need to have an entity in between this. It could just be a smart contract that is being signed. The process is fully digitized. So we are signing smart contracts. I need this from you and I'm paying this amount. The money has been moved from my account. Once you deliver the services or once the goods get to me, you move that money. And this will be very important. Um, I don't know if I should quickly put this in there, but there's a whole lot to address when it comes to transport. So EU works because you have things like Ryanair. It literally costs about 10 euros to move from, say, London to Copenhagen. Um, we don't have that in Ghana yet. Sometimes, sometimes I have to pay more, which not only me, literally everyone here knows this very much. You have to pay more moving from Accra to some other African country than you do have to, to some European countries. And that's really horrible. I mean, if we can't solve that transport issues, uh, it makes it impractical to start talking about free trade agreement and, and the easy movement of people and then uh, goods. Yeah, um, it's actually something you talked about there. So you talked about the escrow payment is, is, is a really important um, element. We talked about escrow and you also mentioned blockchain because blockchain has enjoyed different levels of acceptance in different countries. So, uh, yeah, can you elaborate on this a little bit just in terms of blockchain where you don't have that, you don't have the need for the trusted central party, but it's more distributed. Is that something well, that is going to be taken well, one, one thing is that the, the African continental free trade has not yet negotiated on e-commerce. And it's one of the things that they are yet to negotiate because surely they have to negotiate. And so private sectors might be involved in all these blockchains and what have you, but it's not one of the negotiation and uh, products on the table. And it's very, very important. Um, I know that the Secretary General, the incoming one, maybe the Secretary General, has plans to uh, really have push towards this um, digital um, uh, payment and then the e-commerce um, doesn't come fully yet. However, I'd like to touch on a few things that, uh, in th you see, under the continental free trade, I keep saying that in terms of innovation, you have to uh, develop your product comparativity, comparativeness. So I look at three things under uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, product comparative, the process and your business models. And if I say product comparative, being it government or private sector, for example, I know, for example, in Addis, Addis, 
the, the, the there is a quest or there is the market demand for uh, cooking utensils a lot. How did I get to know? If I found out myself by researching and there should be a survey, a bureau, where I can go to the Ministry of Trade or go to any other uh, agencies of the Ministry of Trade to get such information now. The comparative advantage that as a, as a private sector person, a company, I can have is that I can decide to trade in that, meet the demand in a sister, a member, a member state, or government can look at the comparative advantage of a product. So it's important in, in an entrepreneurship to identify your product comparativity. For example, if you take Ghana and, and in Cote d'Ivoire, you know that these are the two largest cocoa producing uh, nations. However, the revenue of chocolate that comes to the whole world is not from the two of them, it's from Netherlands. And that is a serious concern. And so when you identify your product comparativity, you don't draw your value chains. Because what is important, a similar type of blockchain that Cronenta Future is pointing out is commodity exchanges because it's very, very, very key. And I, I like to commend the East African region. They have done a lot when it comes to commodity exchange. Because at the end of the day, you need to have, how does the farmer get a good price for what he has done? Who, who goes on behalf of the farmer? Also the state, how would the state store some of these products from the farmer? And so commodity exchanges act like a broker between bro a broker and the farmer, a farmer and then the buying agencies. And, and then if you take East Africa, they have used blockchain, they have looked, you use blockchain to get our commodity exchange to develop so wide. And I'm like, I would like us to zoom on them to study. The second is the process. Under continental free trade, if you have taken after you have the product and you know which market is going, what kind of process are you using? Now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. How are you going to process your 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 value, your product that you will have chosen to be a comparative to the, uh, to the member states? If you choose an an old phase out process and somebody is using an AI process or you are using a fourth industrial revolution process to make sure that he gets the upper hand. Of course, if you are not careful, you are going to be there, the opportunity to be there. Let's take a critical example of um, automobile companies setting up in Africa. Okay? Automobile companies setting up in Africa is a typical example. The rules of origin will allow either holy owned L you take some, some uh, to the ordinary man, let me go down to the ordinary, some parts are coming from outside the free trade, free trade area into the free trade, free trade area. And then what happens? Mm -hmm. You cannot take a total 100% uh, uh, price value over where the raw materials are, not all the raw materials are coming from you. Some are coming from third party. At the end of the day, you brand it in the name of the third country, for example. Maybe uh, you want to manufacture a uh, 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 view. What is agreement in Ghana? The agreement is assemble it. So after assembling it, made, what is, how are you going to prepare? It's going to be made in Ghana. And if you are going to export it to a member country, under which rules of origin? These are sensitive areas that we have to look for. And that is one of the things that in the agreement in under uh, trading uh, commodity, uh, trading goods, anti-dumping is one of the things that the agreement frowns upon. So that you cannot repackage a product coming from a third country and then rebrand it and name it made in Ghana or made in Nigeria. No. So you have to identify a product, identify the process to which that product can have a comparative advantage. And then the last thing is develop a business model. The business model is very, very important. What kind of business model are you going to use? And always your business model should focus on the customer's benefit. It should focus on how your customer service is going to be. So that if, for example, let's take the, uh, 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 one of the reasons why most of uh, most Africans are, are not enjoying a lot of customers are because most of them don't have competition policies. Most don't have competition policies. Some of these multinationals come in and do whatever they want to do and they get away. And so I am happy that with the incoming phase two competition policies, the countries are going to negotiate and see where countries who are even uh, in the name and bullying others are. For example, we take Apple and go, you realize that in Europe, they have been going through a lot of suits, suits here and there because some of them will not will try to stifle the, 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 the upcoming or the growing up of some of these, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, startups. Without a competition policy seriously within after, it is going to be difficult actually to even for you to accentuate whether a product in itself is origin. And so after identifying the product, comparativity, look at your process. After identifying your process, look at your business model. These are things that can be done by the private sector, not necessarily government, to be able to benefit within the free trade area. 
a really good point there. Actually, um, Darlington, I wanted to direct this to you. Uh, you've got things like AI, Internet of Things. So you have, you're able to track origin, uh, AI, Internet of Things, and blockchain, right? Is this something that we can use to try and resolve what we just, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there's, there's a lot that these technologies would allow us to do. Um, it could go from even something like, so IoT, you could have devices that are tracking the movement of goods. So I made mention of people using tracks, but even if you are shipping some products, because we still have a lot of ports, seaports uh, across Africa, I think there are what, about 30 something countries that have ports. Um, so if you're moving goods across the sea, you could have IoT devices that are tracking them. And so that is very important for trans transparency. And so on that, do we have the right capability, like on the continent, people with the skills to code, uh, again, artificial intelligence, you know, do we have that capability, Emmanuel? <laughs> do you want to jump in? No, yeah, I'm a huge, um, definitely, and thank you, um, Shirley. I'm a huge fan of Darlington's work. I think a, a more reflective model is some of the work that he's been putting out actually for free on tracking um, COVID and healthcare, right? So the ability then um, um, to use at scale responsive data and policy decisions and then intervention that can be exploited by entrepreneurs. I think that what I wanted to do, though, is recalibrate a conversation and take a step back because when you think of the top six or maybe top 10 um, businesses in America or industries. It is not the North American free trade agreements that is making these things happen. It, it is a framework that allows for entrepreneurship and innovation and for people to exploit it. So when Facebook is working, nobody goes and says, well, Facebook is not a global place or NASA is working. You, you, you understand that the, the, the ground is fertile, the soil is fertile, but the fruits itself of those things come from companies and businesses, a, a, a bit of a piggyback to what Lois is saying. I think that because it seems like there have been structural resistance and the ecosystem on the African continent is more difficult um, and, and not as, as accommodating in how capital markets work in Europe and America, we assume that the continental free trade itself is what is gonna solve these issues. That's not the case. So when we speak about um, uh, monitoring and evaluation, what you're doing is you've created a, a legal framework that allows people who come up with interventions, if it's blockchain technology, if it's some type of distributed ledger, if it's artificial intelligence, um, if it's crowdsourcing, what that happens is that the legal barriers of operating in different states, Hello. whether because of uh, uh, government protocols or whether because of currency, those are removed. But that's exploitation and that initiative still needs to happen. Another thing I want to say, because I was looking at the demographics of people who are part of your big ideas is most of these, we do have economists, um, trade negotiators who are working on this. We want everybody to pay attention, but what personally my plea to people is, don't get caught up in some of um, kind of like the details of what you see. Because of us. What so now on, for those who are listening, if you are in the agriculture, maybe it's more commodities. I'm more involved, even though the economy is negotiated. In which ways we start to create our own for us by us platforms that speak to our language? When you go to uh, South Asia, they don't use an American system. They don't read from left to right. They have a market that has been conducive enough that their innovators have created an adaptive ecosystem. Unfortunately for us, all our platforms are foreign. We may have a few local languages that need to be mm -hmm. translated. So we, we get excited that, oh, Google has translated to Swahili or to Yoruba. That, that's not how you compete as a frontier market player. No, 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 no. That's joking. So, so the conversation should move from awareness mm -hmm. of the, the agreement. Then everybody should say, okay, this is my role as a stakeholder. This is how I plug into it. These are the opportunities that are available. Yes, there will be challenges. So then for us, it's, it's understanding what phase of, um, and exploiting that, what phase of negotiations are, are happening, understanding the legal restrictions, because you also need to understand. It's not just rosy for you to say that now, 
Uh, I'm opening my house, so me and somebody want to share. There's commitment and sacrifice that each uh, uh, party sign agreement has to has to make sure that um, we put forth. So then that way, then over. So I wanted to recalibrate the conversation, not like after is this magic pill that hey, once we put on the lights, all of a sudden these things happen. It is an infrastructure that helps. Um, with harmonizing trade and removing a lot of the previous barriers. But we also need a second wave of people that benefit from that integration. And then we start to future cast, not like how America or Europe has done it. They have their issues. We, we, we need to start to leapfrog and say, within our diversity of languages and culture, what then does industrialization look like for us? And how does this policy allow us to take care of our own and compete and, and contribute more than the 5% of global trade that we're currently doing now? Okay. Um good point there about stakeholders i think that uh we've talked a little bit about engaging stakeholders how you reach the diaspora how you reach a normal person i think that one good thing about engaging stakeholders is the ability to identify the benefit for them so if we're going to talk a bit about benefits i think that youth unemployment is a huge factor that i'd like to talk about and are there you know, I think that, for example, uh, some of the time that I've spent with some uh, global companies, we had a matrix managed system where we can see different skills in different projects or on different projects. And we sort of move them around as and when needed, just like they've managed to achieve some semblance of, you know, um, you know, demand supply in Nevada in Europe. Do we have the, the the ability to move skills across the continent as and when needed? And with the advent of things like remote working, I mean, do we have that ability? Do we have that ability to try and solve things like youth unemployment with a single market? I'm going to open this up to any of you. <laughs> oh. Louis, you I, I thought you were giving a comment yourself. <laughs> so, are so you asking, uh, kind of, can you reframe you your question again? Yeah, I just think that, Sorry. you know, we talked a little bit about, we talked a little bit about the movement of goods and we understand the challenges yes. there um, and the use of, potential use of um, technology to resolve that, even tracking and tracing with uh, technology such as blockchain, IoT, et cetera. In terms of skills, you know, it's all well to have, you know, an open market. But in terms of skills, I mean, with high youth unemployment, it's undoubtedly a factor that we're dealing with things like economic scarring, lack of skills. How do we engage young people to realize that they are actually stakeholders in this day? Their future ability to earn and just kind of create economic wealth for themselves is by being part of this, this journey, right? And so... Sorry, it's a bit of a long-winded question, but do we have the capability to move skills across the continent as and when needed, depending on where they are? Let's just say that there's a skill shortage in Kenya, but there's a surplus somewhere else. Do we have that kind of global view? When I say global, African global. Yes, I I, I did say I'm doing I'm doing I'm working I'm doing a project soon on what we call the exporting of skills. With the exporting of skills, the academia is supposed to be part. For example, there are few trade lawyers under after. And so it's an opportunity for students of law to position themselves, number one. Number two, what we are trying to do in the couple of uh, skills as, uh, export is, if, as I said earlier, if you graduate in a field of study in your country and you realize that that country uh, you don't have wide opportunities and you're able to identify from another member state the ability to accommodate for you to work there that is one solution to it the second solution has to do with having social innovation programs by member states that attract the youth to go into so many areas it turk farming and and value chains and what have you for instance during the COVID 19 in Ghana like this, we realize a lot of innovations. People came out with so many, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, innovations from um, washing, um, machine, washing, I mean, hand washing machines and what have you. Now, what we need to do, for example, what after policy network we are doing is that we are, we are doing what we call institutional partnership. That institutional partnership, we are trying to identify institutions that can help startups like this, which mostly sometimes involve the youth. Sometimes government agencies might not come in. 
So what we want to do is that, for example, if we realize that you are the type of innovate something, what do you do next? Some of them don't know where to go. We have to tell them that, look, you have to go to a certified, go for certification from the uh, certification board. If he doesn't have the capacity, we have to support him in terms of legalities, in terms of paperwork. Beyond that, he may be needy, he might need some uh, financial uh, backing. So what we do, we have to show him, go to this agency, the, within the year, they are given this so and so amount to help your capacity. Again, after he has come out with that innovation, he might not know copyright issues. So what we're doing is that we are partnering copyright uh, legal bodies to help them come uh, patent it. If we begin to fill in the gaps of some of these ends, either as an institution or as CSOs or as private sector, we will we'll be able to give our people a lot of self-employment because some of them, like uh, Darlington said, it becomes more true when they don't have the support and it dies naturally like that. No. As we're speaking, do you know that we have an African WhatsApp which has been developed in Senegal? But if this app is going to see the, the daylight in Africa, he needs to get that support of enlisted. Who is going to help him in terms of uh, certification or standardization in his country? Who is going to help in terms of financial support to cushion him? Who is going to help in terms of intellectual property rights? Who is going to help in terms of competition? Who is going to help in terms of uh, 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 promo or what have you? All these should be factored as kind of agencies who are on standby to help catapult. Silicon Valley did not start in a day. Look in Ghana, Dr. Mason, the renowned fiber inventor, came to establish Silicon Valley. He, as an individual, how did he do it? He sold out the opportunity to the, the his people in the US who said, I'm ready to partner you, I'm ready to support, I'm ready to finance. And they all put together. He was able to raise $500 million, $500 million dollars that is not government that is a private sector and so when we have these standby support systems ready when there are more uh, startups from the youth they are able to enhance expand and then stand on their feet before they can export that is key and that is what i'm saying that the content of video is not going to do that for countries countries must find a way of strategizing countries must build upon the existing Approaches that they have using this new opportunity. Continental Free Trade says, "I'm giving you 80% or boost to boost your export. I'm not coming to think for you. So you think I've opened the market for you. After you have come out with an invention, please come to Tunisia. Bring your product. It's free entry. That is what Continental Free Trade Agreement is going to do for you. But you want you want to program your youth program your unemployment curves to make sure that." they begin to dive because now they have the opportunity to export other things that were not they were not able to export prior to the continental future agreement a critical area is for example if you take cocoa value chain cocoa apart from just having the cocoa seeds there are so many value chains a youth can identify it look i don't have the capital to be able to buy a whole cocoa farm but i can be able to do promo advert or documentary using tech technology for companies that are in that session. It's a value chain. Okay, I can, I'm a graphic designer. I can design the packaging for a company within the value chain of Cocoa. You must begin to identify the value chains as an agency, as an institution to enable the vast majority of you or unemployed people to, to flow in. This is how it's going to work. Shelly? Yeah, no, no, I've got you. Darlington, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, sorry for because my endless I internet issues. Yeah, I think I, I strongly agree with that, which is that, so the interesting thing about this is that both businesses, startups, but also especially those in technology, there are ways to ensure that the free trade agreement is truly implementable based on all the dreams uh, and ideals that we all wanted to be but also we could benefit from it too as well. So I like the point for me, the key word there is trade and trade is very much a private sector, uh, mainly driven thing. Government should be there to ensure that monopolies and a bunch of people do not uh, bully and take advantage of others. And we don't, we prevent things like Brexit from happening where some countries don't feel like they've benefited from free trade agreements or they feel like they've 
they've lost more than they've benefited. So government is supposed to have that policy to prevent some of these extremities, but the free hand of the, of uh, demand and supply needs to exist. So I think for us in the private sector, for us in the tech sector, there's a lot of solutions we can already provide to facilitate the free trade agreement, and there's a lot of ways that we can benefit. I think a practical way of looking at this, I think, Shelley, we've had this discussion in marketplace, like, if, if there was a digital platform that if you have some skills, you can go on there and then just see that, hey, I can do this. If, if we are providing AI solutions to companies, we don't even need to physically be in another African country to do this for them. Um, if just give us a request in Ghana, if you are in Malawi, and if we are providing that solution to you and we have smooth uh, digital payment platforms, then you pay us digitally. I mean, there's no need to actually do any uh, actual physical goods being moved back and forth. So yeah, I definitely agree that there's a whole lot of opportunities for private sector to benefit as well as to make sure the process is efficient. So I wanted to add a bit to what uh, Darlington just said. If you take the protocol of trading services, there are three models under it, and most of them have been happening already. Model, uh, I like the model two. The model two is selling services across from your country, and if you can be in your country, and the model two example is education and tourism, whereby you can position uh, an aviation. Is one that is model two, trying to sell or export a kind of services from one end where to benefit the consumer on the other side. And a critical example is either moving the people there or moving the technology there. And as I said, you have something like aviation, you have tourism, so that airlines fall within these categories. Ethiopian airline is partnering Ghana on a 60 to 40 agreement. Because Ethiopian airlines have a lot of fleets and they have a lot of flight paths. And so that is one area. In terms of hospitality, you have a lot of hotels. In Putin's there are about five star Russian billionaire hotels over there. If you have that capacity, you can't only have maybe Sheraton, only uh, Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire. So category two looks at how you can transfer services from one country to another, either physically or technology. The other uh, model one also has to do with people physically represented, maybe having a bank positioned in another member country, like the Ecobank. Ecobank can be seen in most African countries. That is another model of the trading services, where they, have, they, they either can move technology across, because you can use an Ecobank app, whether you are in Ghana or you are in Malawi. It is still Ecobank. And so all these things have to be known. My emphasis is on the fact that if you don't know, you would be doing, we'll be doing the normal things we were doing as before Conender uh, uh, came in, there will be no difference. But if we know and we add the touch to it, then we can be able to know that we have arrived. And that thing says something, and that is very important. How do we sustain this agreement for the future generation? It means that we have to engage the academia. In one of my concepts, when I was going through this process before the con became a draft, I proposed that we need to have it's a curriculum being built in African institutions. And by time God, we are going to have an MOU with the, with uh, Kwame Kuma University of Science and Technology. We're also going to have an agreement with Sango University. Sango University is a very reputed university in Africa to develop curriculum, short, short courses. I can see why an university in UK is doing uh, uh, master class courses for uh, institutions in Ghana and we pay when we cannot develop the same curriculum here for them to come and learn. When I started some of these things, I had some calls from uh, uh, staff from uh, US trade, uh, trade commerce who wanted to know more about content in the future. I can tell you, people outside Africa are studying this concept and building into academia, into curriculum, than we who are here. And so, if we don't to build it in an academic a curriculum for our people to study, there will be another basis. So to avoid it, we need to do it. And it should be not in the classroom room. I'm happy that a friend of mine, who is a colleague, has developed the app. You have the African Community Free Trade app, you go to Play Store, and you type in African Community, you have the app. That tells you a lot 
about what economic free trade, which countries have ratified, where we are now, where we are going. This is what we need to do. Let us have it everywhere we are so that we can steady build upon it and expand. Thank you. Yeah, okay. um, I definitely Listen, agree. I just, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, darling. Uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge the people for coming to. I think the lot, the guy, a lot of uh, young people on the uh, screen who not necessarily have they found this to be extremely uh, helpful for them. And you know, I just think that if anybody wants to get involved and learn more as a young person, how do they get started? Sorry, Darlington, I will come to you, but I want to answer some of that question. Was the question to me? Yeah. Or well, even, I mean, you know, yeah, I think it's important to Your line was a bit I would like to know how Darlington. Oh, is oh, uh, I'll it's just write my now. question. Yeah. Oh, is it better now? Yeah, it's better now. But I was going to ask uh, the designs are finding it very useful. But if the young on this team wants to get involved to learn more, you know, before everything is in place, how can they get? Connected? Well, if I could hear you, you're saying that how could they get involved? Is that a question? Yeah. How, okay. How I can speak for my network. Um, the Secretariat is going to represent the whole of the 54 countries. Now, for my network, uh, I keep saying, for now, it has become like uh, the largest free trade international NGO. And we use our social media base as a strong network approach to get virtual participants. And through that, we bring on board professionals across the globe. If I know your professional background, I bring you on board through my social media uh, outlet. And then when the opportunities, I contact you to let you know where your field of expertise will be contacted either at the international level or at the local towards a private sector. That's one thing I do. An example, we are going to build what we call the Hope City. And so we are partnering with uh, the a, a company in US that manufactures rockets and then satellites to build in all the African countries this kind of skill development technology where people come and train and know the benefit of aerospace. And so if I know you're a member of my network, through the social media outlets, when there's a need and there's a time for you to participate, we give you the, the, the direction how to go about it. Because as it stands now, the African Union has already given its blessing to the Secretariat to work. The Secretariat is not going to come to individual Kofi A, Mr. A, B, C, and offer your opportunity. It is you who is going to go yourself, find out the information, and form an association, form CSOs or private sector to open up to them and find out what can I do in the member state. They are going to open up opportunities and contracts of employment. I've been only few. In fact, half employment, I even don't want most people to look at that area because the secretary doesn't want to employ many. They're just going to employ few, but they can offer the opportunity for you to create jobs within the member states. And so that is one way that I can help somebody who want to be part of the process. The Hope City is going to be a training excellence center. So we are trying to partner firms outside Africa to take advantage of it. Entrepreneurship, trade, and technology. Technology. That is one approach. The second other approach is we are allowing individuals who want to partner to form satellite offices whichever country they find themselves in the area of tourism, in the area of hospitality, in the area of your expertise, technical, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, what is the name? Uh, apl applied applied science, or uh, I was going to use the polytechnic approach, where some people have the, the skills but they don't know what to do next. That can be developed out. These are the areas that we have positioned ourselves to offer that uh, uh, support. I hope you're clear. I see. Yes, I am. I hope I'm audible. So, Darlington, I am aware that we're coming to. 
there's so much um, I think it's done much the purpose of the iceberg. Uh, so I wanted to ask you a question, especially as an entrepreneur, um, what soft skills, and this is something that I will be talking about in, a, in another uh, round of the session, but what do you need to work on in terms of soft skills, diplomacy, you know, things like professionalism, leadership, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and that mainly yeah, um... outside of the classroom. Yeah, I mean, uh, soft skills, yes. Um, rather than even maybe mention specific soft skills, uh, I, there was this point in my head, um, and I think that's also connected to a point you made, uh, I think, yesterday, which is the fact that so people underestimate, when you look at Africa from the outside, you can see, oh, Africans and beautiful people and all that. People underestimate how disconnected Africans really are within the continent itself. Um, <laughs> I've had the opportunity to work with different African countries. There are a lot of uh, cultural issues. And then you realize that some Africans have a hesitation towards working with other Africans. And these are all barriers. So if talking about soft skills, there are a number of soft skills so far as yes, uh, it's helping you better engage and convince other people that, hey, you know what? even before the skills itself, just genuinely like these people, actually genuinely have an interest in uh, people from other African countries, genuinely want to work with them, and then develop the skills to be able to engage them, try to understand their cultures, to understand that there are certain things in uh, other African countries that you don't do. Um, in East Africa, they tend to be more liberal compared to, uh, say, West Africa. Uh, you should be okay with that. You should not be offended by someone maybe having a lot of uh, extra, <laughs> what, what do you call it, extra beautification process, or they have a lot of um, earrings or something like that, and you are judging them from your very minuscule outlook of culture. So just being open to that and trying to understand people, I think, goes a long way. Um, but yeah, I like a lot of the points that Yao, Yao made. Um, there's still, there's still a lot to do to actually make this practical. And Yao made mention of sets like to connect that to some of the comments that I'm reading, people complaining about the internet. So there's a lot of uh, people looking at low Earth orbit internet. So you have satellites that you fly to low orbits and they are able to basically, quote unquote, beam internet to the Earth. Um, people are looking at other opportunities. These opportunities for either those who are already in the telco space or new businesses to form up to provide high quality internet to multiple African countries. Currently, uh, Starlink, this is a company by Elon Musk. They are looking at doing this and then being able to provide high speed internet to countries across the world. We don't have any African company that is in this space. None of the telcos I've been thinking about high-speed internet, low Earth orbits, none of it. So this is a huge problem. If, if we can have some African companies that are into this space, whoever solves that problem would be able to have access to uh, basically the whole African continent. And then we can at least alleviate this whole internet breaking issues and having difficulties, having uh, meetings on, on <laughs> online platforms. Yeah. But even if you talk about transportation, there's also a lot to be done there. So in the current state, yes, railways are a major way to solve that. You have trains, just your old traditional trains. Yeah. Shelly, were you saying something? Yeah, so I was saying if uh -huh. I think I have a slight delay with my internet, uh, so I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, I can hear you. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I was saying that if you have, um, so with traditional railway systems, if you have traditional trains, that would go a long way to help. There's a strong okay, so the question is, if I was a young person and I was choosing the subjects to study it, Ooh. Can you repeat that question again?
what's the question? I think I have two minutes delay. So oh, wow. um, just give me a quick second, okay? Sure. Yeah, I have two minutes delay. Um, just give me a quick second. Okay. So the question, I'm going to type it. <laughs> um i'm having a lot of terrible connection problems um Yeah, but I can hear you now. Um, maybe there might still be the lag and delay, but I can okay. hear you. Oh, God. I've got internet problems. I've got terrible internet problems. I'm not quite sure <laughs> if you can hear me. I don't think you can. Oh, this is terrible. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. There might really be a lag, but I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, my goodness. Worst timing. Am I audible? Okay. Okay. Oh gosh. Okay, fine. So if I was a young person and I was choosing subjects, what sorts of things would I be looking at? You know, is it um, operations? Is it finance, legal, compliance? Well, compliance you don't really get in, in school, but is it tech? Is it Python? Is it Java? What kind of stuff do people need? Yeah. So I'll yeah, just ask about yeah. a long question. So I hope that came through. Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, if you're a young person, what field should you be interested in? Oh, this is terrible. Things? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Am I back? Yes. Is it better now? I think so. So if I was a young person selecting my topics, what do I study? Do I study math? Uh... Hello, Shirley. Okay, um... I think we, I don't know if we lost Shelly, but then um, I think if I understand the question correctly, if you are a young person and then you are studying, uh, what do you study? Um, should it be math, should it be tech, should it be finance? I would argue that um, find what you're passionate about and study that because there's opportunity for multiple fields. You don't necessarily need to be in one particular field to have benefits. Um, Yao made mention of even with packaging, there's a lot of opportunity for those who are in design. So if you're not passionate about tech, don't go into tech because there's a lot of opportunity in there. That's a horrible idea. But then, then again, that's just my personal advice. If you're asking me potentially which sectors could benefit a whole lot, finance, technology, 
I think technology is basically eating up a lot of fields globally. Um, and if a lot of tech people across Africa are going to be taking advantage of this, we are going to see this with the uh, African continental free trade area too as well. So uh, tech has tremendous opportunities across the world in the next few decades. Um, tech is eating all kinds of sectors. But again, as opposed to you going into tech, find whatever sector you're passionate about, then find out how yeah. tech connects to that sector. So I, for example, yes, I work in artificial intelligence and then other uh, industry 4.0, but then I'm interested in a number of sectors. So I'm applying that to healthcare, to agriculture, we also have education yeah. and then other things. So it's very similar. What are you passionate about? Even more interesting, Africa has a lot of problems. So look at your community, look at your country, look at other countries and see what are the very tremendous, what are the very uh, detrimental problems that you can see? What would you like to do about those problems? And then how can technology, finance, and all these various verticals help you address those problems? And what do you need to study together? That's always a better way to approach things. Yeah, I agree. Yao, you came back just at the right time because I'd like to close off with one of over time a little bit. Uh, so I'd just like to get some closing comments yourself, darling. Can you hear me? And then we can go to Yao. So, yeah, hi, Yao. Can you hear me? Yeah, can I can. Yes, yes. Yes, you can. I think yeah. I missed a lot. We've had some internet problems also with myself. So, uh, yeah, you're not the so only you, one. You. But um, so, uh, sadly, it is what it is. So, uh, darling, in terms of closing comments. Sorry, yeah, just one second. Just one second. I'm just coming to closing comments. So, my um, closing comment, I'm right? Coming to closing comments. So, darling, in terms of creating comments, in terms of entrepreneurship and innovation, what would you say? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, my closing comment will be that if you are a young entrepreneur, if you already have a business, a startup, or you intend to start one, African free trade um, agreement or area is a huge thing that is happening now. However, there's a lot of uh, unsolved issues about it. So as an entrepreneur, there's opportunities for you to look at flaws within it or potential unsolved areas and think about business opportunities that you can provide solutions to that. So it could be infrastructure, it could be transportation, it could be payments, provide those solutions. And then you have access to a huge market to make money from. If you, on the other hand, you can also think about the fact that if you don't only have access to your country, you have access to multiple countries uh, that is across the African country, how does this help you to scale? So you need to rethink about your scaling. So uh, yes, that's, that's a huge opportunity for existing and then uh, uh, up and coming businesses. That will be my closing remarks. Great, thank you so much. Concise, interesting. I'm sure the guys really appreciate it. Yao, uh, Louis, I'd like to come to you for closing comments. Yes, I would like to say That's that. Really um, I would like to say that in the area of entrepreneurship and innovation, uh, I would like to uh, end by saying that one, it is not always what you are passionate about that drives you, but as you are passionate about, you need training. Some of the things you might be passionate about, but you need, you, you need to have training for it, number one. Number two, I would like us to use this model I call the STVN. STVN stands for Startup Transformation and Value Networking. Value Network. I wouldn't have my time to go into STVN, but it's a model that I want to assure all the youth or young entrepreneurs, after you have your startup, go into transformation. After your transformation, go into what we call the value networking. And you can benefit under this huge uh, 2.3 trillion uh, uh, revenue target that is going to come from the continental free trade agreement. Thank you. 
Thank you, guys. Sadly, we lost a few of our participants along the way. The internet has been absolutely brutal with us. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone, uh, including the audience members who gave very good questions and comments. Thank you so much. If you do have any desire to get in touch with uh, either of my panel uh, panelists, uh, <laughs> feel free to get in touch. Let us know, and we'll we'll keep you in, in in touch. I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Thank you so much for your time. I'd like to thank my panelists as well for making the time to talk to us about this very important um, development. Um, thank you so much. My name is Shelley, and hopefully we'll see you again next next time. Thank you, guys. Ah.